In the spring, Biddulph Grange becomes a riot of colour, as indeed do most of our own gardens. These glorious blooms highlight the changing cycle of the seasons. The pace of spring is quickening. All around us, new life is springing up to the surface. The nights are drawing out, the days are getting longer, and the sun is returning. The end of April is the time of the ancient pagan fire festival of Beltane. Bonfires were lit all across the country, and their sparks would kindle new life into existence and drive out evil spirits. The ashes would even be collected in and taken around with you throughout the year as a protective symbol. Some people even took the opportunity to rise early in the morning and would take the fresh morning dew to their face to bring on youthfulness. It is said that the ancient Britons reenacted the Greenwood marriage, where the union of the horned god Hearn the Hunter and the goddess ensured the fertility of the land. Hearn became a great white stag, transformed into the prey he hunted, and chased the goddess, manifested as a white deer, across the land, until, upon their union, she transformed him back into his original form. This whole time is a celebration of the potency and fertility of the earth. One of the most quintessential of the Maytime fertility rituals is still practiced widely today. The ritual of Maypole dancing goes back a very long way. Our first written reference comes from a mid 14th century Welsh poem, but the tradition probably goes back much further. The symbolism of the maypole continues to be debated to this day. It could be a remnant of ancient pagan tree worship, or could link to Eastern traditions and represent the axis of the world. Others have traced it to the ancient Norse cosmological view of the universe as a world tree. Modern authors and Freudian psychoanalysts see it as a representation of the phallus, emphasising sexuality above all else. Or perhaps, more simply, maypoles may be a rejoicing of spring and a representation of the growth of new vegetation. Our present incarnation of the maypole dance, probably much changed over the centuries, follows a simple pattern. Pairs of men and women standing alternately around the base of the pole each hold the end of a ribbon. They then weave the ribbons around each other until they all meet at the base. Maypoles are often temporarily erected on greens and in fields, but some villages hold the tradition so strongly that they have a permanent maypole set throughout the year. The tallest ever maypole is said to have been erected in 1661 on the Strand in London. Standing 143 feet high, it was felled in 1717 by Isaac Newton, who needed such a pole to support Huygens' new reflecting telescope. Other important Beltane rituals involved fire, which was thought to cleanse, purify and increase fertility. People would leap over the fire's dying embers to bring good fortune for the year ahead. Beside the River Derwent, the valley side is carpeted in the most admired spring wildflower, the daffodil. But this is not the garden variety. These are the true native wild daffodils. Smaller, paler, daintier and far less showy than their cultivars. 
It was once incredibly common throughout the country, but now has disappeared from much of its range, and just survives in isolated pockets. The daffodil's Latin name, Narcissus, refers to an ancient Greek legend. A long time ago, a young wood nymph named Echo fell in love with a young man, who was named Narcissus. He was bestowed by the gods with the gift of great beauty and eternal youth, as long as he never looked at his reflection. Totally self-absorbed, he spurned Echo, who was consumed by love until all that was left was a voice. Nemesis, the goddess of vengeance, in retribution led him to a shimmering mountain lake that mirrored his face. There, at the water's edge, he became transfixed, caught in the sad spell of his own beauty. Unable to move, the gods turn Narcissus into a scented flower, which droops down to admire itself in the spring waters. And if you look in its dainty cup, you can still see Narcissus's tears. Although the daffodil is now the most popular spring flower, one is more intricately connected with the ancient pagan festival of Beltane than any other. This is Hawthorn, the most iconic tree of the British springtime. The flowers of the Hawthorn, also known as the Maybush, were made into bouquets and garlands which were fastened to houses to evoke the power of the fire of life. Some Hawthorn trees were even decorated with ribbons and people would dance around them to summon the ancient spirits. The rich green leaves were often eaten and the blossom and berries were commonly made into wines and jellies. This gives the Hawthorn its old country name, bread and cheese. Hawthorns certainly have a wide variety of uses, but by far the most practical is their use in our hedgerows. Strongly interwoven together, they make up tens of thousands of miles of boundary lines across the Peak District. These are also important wildlife corridors, allowing small mammals to travel unseen, whereas if they were out in the open, they could easily be spotted and killed by a predator. When you visit a place like Biddulph Grange and see its plethora of wildflowers from all over the world, it's easy to forget the beauty of our own. As we speak behind me, the hawthorn is coming out, along with a whole variety of other beautiful spring flowers. Lesser Selenite. Cowslip. Opposite-leaved golden saxifrage.
crossword. Red Campion. Lords and Ladies. All of the flowers you just saw were found on a country walk around the secluded Bearder Valley, just a short distance from the moorland village of Eaton. It is hard to imagine that this tranquil scene was once a hive of industry. At the lowest part of the valley lie the remains of Bearder Corn Mill. Dating back to the 16th century, it was set up by the monks of the nearby Dulacress Abbey. The mill used the power of water to grind its corn in order to make bread and grain products for the local area. The small stream, which had just begun its flow off the high moors, was dammed to create a mill pond. This stored up the water to ensure that even if no rain had fallen and the stream level dropped, there would still be enough to power the mill. At the end of the mill pond, a small leak was constructed which channelled water towards the wooden wheel. As the wheel was turned, it moved a great quern stone which, as it rotated, ground down the grain. The seeds would be fed in via a hopper to the small gap between the top quern stone and its partner below. Bearda is now calm and quiet, but here we see a beautifully preserved local corn mill in action. As well as being living museums, many of our preserved water mills still grow and grain today, and even offer it for sale in small quantities. If you've never tried bread made from stone ground flour, I thoroughly recommend it. It's beautiful. However, it does have its downsides too, because as the quern stones grind away at the corn, they also grind away at each other to the point where there's small bits of stone within every single slice of bread you have. This means by the time you're in your 40s, you'd have no teeth left. The beautiful mill at Bearder behind me ceased work in the 1890s and has since been converted into a lovely country home. Small operations such as this existed all over the country from Roman times. But milling on a grand scale did not take place until the 1800s. And all of this is really down to the work of one extraordinary man. His name was Richard Arkwright. And now we shall travel across to the far eastern Peak District to trace back the origins of his story.